Constant streaks of lightning accompanied the heavy rain, illuminating the dark night in a series of short and bright bursts, each flash accompanied by an earth-shaking boom of echoing thunder. Rainwater flowed down the street, speeding through drainage ditches along the sides of the roads before vanishing into storm drains. Standing in the road, shadows snarled at the dinosaur down the street. Version 2. The Thing had a similar body shape to Shadow, also able to go from standing on two legs or comfortably down on all fours with ease, but it was updated. It was faster, stronger, deadlier. It had a set of teeth that belonged to the prehistoric shark-like fish Adesta sticking out of its mouth, their placement, leaving no room for a tongue or the ability to fully close its maw, giving the creature a truly horrific look. Its eyes also glowed a sick yellow color. Both Shadow and Version 2 were covered in fresh wounds, scratch marks, bite marks, deep wounds from the dangerous spiked tails each dinosaur had. The claws, teeth, and spikes on both the hybrid dinosaurs were made special. They could penetrate the armor that covered both hybrids. Version 2 roared and charged, and so did Shadow. Shadow jumped first and landed on its back, which had a row of spikes that ran along it. One went clean through Shadow's hand as he landed. Shadow sunk his sickle claws into Version 2's side and began biting and scratching viciously at the back of the other dinosaur's neck. Version 2 snarled and threw the both of them to the ground while trying to shake Shadow off. Shadow started to stand, but Version 2 kicked and slashed his toe claws across Shadow's face twice and was able to stand up before Shadow could. Version 2 lunged and sunk his terrifying teeth into Shadow's leg and tripped him. And before he could get back up, Version 2 stepped on Shadow's neck, pinning him to the ground under his foot. The superior dinosaur roared, his head reared back and facing the dark, rainy sky, and he prepared to sink his own Utah Raptor claw into Shadow's neck. Fifteen days earlier. After running through the forest for several hours, with Dylan clinging to his back all the while, Shadow finally slowed down and then settled down in a small forest clearing to sleep. He spent the rest of the night holding his favorite human close to his side, enjoying everything about sleeping outside for the first time in his life. When morning came, Dylan opened his eyes, feeling rested despite sleeping in a forest filled with dangerous animals. He didn't feel like there was any danger at the moment. The morning was nice, it was serene, peaceful, and cool. A few songbirds were singing in the trees, adding to the serenity. It was peaceful. He was lying against Shadow's shoulder, with the dinosaur's left arm, the one with 000001 burned onto it, tucked around him. The black claws on the end of Shadow's fingers glinted in the morning light, perhaps more vividly than they ever had before, now that they were exposed to the sun. A turn of his head showed Dylan that Shadow was still asleep and breathing softly. He was content, and it was a sight that made Dylan happy to see. Dylan leaned back and simply watched his friend peacefully rest, something he was more than deserving of. Shadow's sleep was disturbed when a grackle suddenly flew out of the trees and landed on his nose. He jumped and lifted his head in surprise, but then smiled. Hello, little friend. He chuckled, making eye contact with the bird, which fluttered off after he snorted softly to encourage it to head on its merry way. He watched it fly away, jaws slightly agape in a way which looked like a grin. Good morning, Dylan said once the bird was out of sight. Shadow turned to face him, still smiling. Good morning. The morning air is even nicer than the night air, Shadow greeted, taking in the views of the forest in full daylight for the first time. Dylan found himself smiling at the sight. His hand inadvertently closed around some leaves, and he felt them slip and crumble between his fingers. I know, it's nice, Dylan replied as Shadow stood, and, since Dylan was leaning against him, this caused him to tumble back. Shadow looked down at him. <laughs> you just gonna lay around all day? He chuckled. No, I need to stretch, Dylan replied, standing up and doing just that. Shadow gave him a lick across the back of the head. 
Hey, not in the hair. This stuff doesn't wash out easily, Dylan protested, wiping as much saliva off as he was able. A hug is not the only way I show affection, Shadow chuckled. Now, I'm ready to go. I want to see what my new home will be like. And what else is in this big world? Hey, hold up a second there, Speedy. We can't just show up and expect to be let inside, Dylan interrupted. I thought you said they took in dinosaurs, Shadow asked. Or talking variants of animals in general. They do. But you're not exactly a normal dinosaur. You've got the armor, the giant claws, the wicked teeth, and the scary glowing eyes. Might give them a fright if you just appear outside of their gates, and frightened people sometimes have itchy trigger fingers. Dylan slowly explained, choosing his words carefully. Shadow nodded, understanding Dylan's concerns, though he seemed slightly agitated. Besides, Dylan continued, you can't just show up and expect to be let right in. They've got to decide if you're trustworthy or not, dinosaur or not. So, I'll go first and explain that I'm with a talking dinosaur, which won't hurt anyone, and ask if they'll let us in. If for some reason they say no, we'll go to another community. Some are more accepting than others, from what I've heard, Dylan assured. With that, they turned and continued on in the direction of the nearest of the United Communities. Though they didn't move exactly fast, because Shadow stopped every few steps to look at something new to him. Dylan smiled each time and didn't mind the frequent stops. Seeing the world for the first time actually made Shadow look more youthful, and like a great weight had been taken away from him, and he felt as such. His gaze was starry and full of wonder as he took in each tree individually, or stopped to watch a passing squirrel, or look at a fern sticking up from the fallen leaves taking in each for the first time in his life. When the community came into view, Dylan had Shadow wait just inside the tree line, and he strode out of the forest and towards the gate. The guards saw him and watched him approach. Wary about the appearance of a stranger with no supplies of any kind. After he was close enough for easy conversation, Dylan raised his hands with palms facing outward and called out, Hello? I hear you offer sanctuary for lone survivors without a home? Yeah, we do. You alone, though? Not many people alone these days, one guard said. Especially ones without any supplies. No, I'm not alone. I've heard you take in talking dinosaurs if there was someone and prove they can be trusted, Dylan said. All of us are willing to. It's in our freaking declaration. It was thought if one community was willing to live with one, then any of us should be willing to, the guard said, not sounding overly fond of the idea. Let's see your friend, the other added, shooting his companion a sideways glare. Uh, okay, just be aware he's... different, even for a dinosaur, Dylan said, and turned to the tree line and motioned Shadow forward. Shadow walked out of the forest and crossed the clearing, walking up to Dylan. Holy shit, what is that? One of the two guards said. I said he was different, Dylan replied. You didn't say he was... A, I, I don't even know what that is. Look, what he is doesn't matter. You said you take in talking ones if they're trustworthy. Bonus points if they're with people. Do you think something like this would just stand here next to me, not killing me if it wasn't trustworthy? Dylan said, and the guards looked at each other. I need to hear it speak, one eventually replied. Um, hello? Shadow greeted. Hearing him speak did not seem to put the other guards at ease. They just shook their heads again. Well, it can talk, one of them said to the other, who nodded. I say we see what Max has to say, the other guard replied, and called down into the community for their leader. When Max appeared on the wall, he had a similar reaction to Shadow as his town guards both did, but after the initial shock, he looked at Dylan for explanation. After getting a short story, Max nodded and said, 
We can give you a temporary cabin until a final home. Just keep an eye on your friend there. He won't cause any problems, Dylan said, lowering his arms. Trust me, trouble is the last thing he wants. Max nodded after taking a few more seconds to look Shadow over. One more question. Why don't you have any supplies, weapons, equipment, anything? Max asked. You kind of left that detail out. Dylan shrugged. Last place we were at didn't work out. We've just been moving since. He explained, keeping as vague yet as convincing and close to the truth as possible. Max seemed to accept the response, at least for the time being. Before opening the gate, he warned the people in his community that they should expect a bit of a shock when they opened the gate, which he did. The warning did not stop several people from gasping or backing up when Shadow strode through the gate with Dylan. Not liking the stares he was getting from people, he growled very softly and Dylan tapped him on the arm, both in reassurance and to tell Shadow that he needed to be quiet. Shadow didn't like the staring. It reminded him of when he was in his cage. They were led to a row of single-room log cabins built along one of the walls and were told to take whichever one they wanted until they got a permanent residence. Things were fine until the evening. A large group of true patriots marched up to the gate, though the community didn't know they were part of the terrorist cell of extremists operating among the Patriots in secret. The number of true Patriots as a whole was around 35. Many were soldiers who never accepted the loss of the war, while others were younger, idealist soldiers who were kids during the war and wanted to see things go back to the way they had been before. The remaining scientists who had been on board with Ian's mad ambitions were also among the terrorist group. They had aspirations of taking over leadership's positions within the Patriots to help the process move along and make sure there wasn't resistance within the people when they were put back on top. They were now closer to their goals than ever, even with version 1 missing. Despite the limited number of guns the Patriots were allowed to have access to following the war, there were enough that the true Patriot soldiers could often take what they needed secretly for their operations when needed. About half those approaching the gate had guns, while the others held various handheld weapons. Upon seeing the potential threat marching to the gate, guards lined up with spears, bows, and guns along the wall, and the gate was opened slightly, just enough for Max to walk through and speak with who he assumed was the leader of a group of Patriot soldiers. Walking out to confront them alone, he stopped ten paces from his gate, and one of the approaching soldiers held up a hand, and stopped the others. He then walked forward to speak with Max. We have reason to believe a traitor and assets have come to your sh community for shelter. Turn them over to us, he said. If you don't, you will face a full-on attack from the entire Patriot Army. Of course, these terrorists couldn't use the Patriot Army, but Max didn't know that these were terrorists. We don't have your traitor or your asset. Also, you should remember that you only have enough guns to protect yourself. If you attack us, or any member of the United Communities, all of us attack you back and we would win again. So back off and leave. Very well. But you'll see us again, the lead soldier said, with a mix between a chuckle and a sneer and they turned and left without making further trouble. Max walked back into the community once he was sure they were gone and went right up to the cabin that Dylan was in. Shadow was laying down outside it, napping. Max stormed past him and up the cabin stairs. He shoved open the door and Dylan jumped at his violent entrance. You and your friend are leaving. I'm not risking another war with the Patriots. I'm sorry, but my community comes first especially since we are so close to their city. Go to this town, he said, handing Dylan a map. They're the furthest away from here. They'll look out for you. Leave tonight under the cover of darkness. With that, he turned and left a stunned and silent Dylan. Max then looked back in after a moment and added, I really am sorry. Good luck. 
Dylan and Shadow did as he asked. After night fell, they left the town. A guard told them which way to go and added that they'd be able to reach the community in around two days if they kept up a good pace and went straight through the forest instead of taking the long, winding roads which would have added days to the travel time. The forest was dark and foreboding on starless nights like the one it was, but Dylan and Shadow were simply happy to be moving further from the Patriots. Shadow didn't mind the darkness nor the foreboding atmosphere, and he kept his friends safe through the night. After they'd stopped to sleep, Shadow spent that night curled around Dylan, keeping him safe from any predators, dinosaur or pre-dinosaur or modern, that might have been lurking about in the forest. They'd had an encounter with an angry Demetrodon the night after leaving Max's community, and Shadow had decided that until they reached their destination, he and Dylan would be as good as attached at the hip. In hindsight, Dylan knew that he should have kept his gun. Dylan really couldn't complain, though. How could you when the one protecting you was the equivalent of a protective ball of spikes, claws, and teeth? He just hoped the leader of this other community would take them in. If not, Dylan supposed that it was a big world out there. Maybe he and Shadow would just have to go somewhere far away and find a home. He was willing to do that, but hopefully walking across the country wouldn't be necessary. With the hunting party still missing in action and presumed dead, the military leadership for the Patriots decided desperate action was needed to find the hybrid. The only functioning helicopter they had left was loaded up with fuel that was still usable and a middle-aged Patriot soldier with curly hair, one who had fought in the war, and he was provided a sniper rifle. This is the only one we have left in the armory, the sniper, a man named Norris, was told by his commanding officer. Take all the ammunition. Make sure you find and kill that hybrid. If the ecosystem out there collapses because of it, we go down with it. I also sent someone ahead to the helicopter to load up boxes of grenades just in case you need them. Just in case the bullets don't do the job. We have no idea what this thing is. But if it wiped out a whole search party, then guns might not be enough. Norris went to the helicopter. The pilot was also a soldier who had fought in the war named Lars. They loaded up and took to the sky flying towards the swamp. About half an hour later, they cleared the trees and came out over the large wetland below them. Norris leaned out of the open door of the two-man helicopter and lifted a pair of binoculars to his eyes, searching for any signs of the dinosaur. If the hybrid wasn't in the area anymore, then the search would have to be widened. He scanned the wetland for several long minutes, spotting several large, long-necked, plant-eating dinosaurs he couldn't identify, as well as several scarily large prehistoric crocodiles, and what looked like an albino Suchomimus, which turned its head to look up at them as they flew over. Norris thought he saw a curious gleam in its eyes that most dinosaurs didn't have. Anything? Lars asked. No, I can't see it. Fly us lower to the ground, we might be too high up. Especially if it's good at hiding, assuming it's even here. Norris shouted back, barely audible over the sounds of the helicopter engine. Lars brought the helicopter lower to the ground and Norris continued searching. Flying lower to the ground proved to be a mistake, because a large flock of pteranodons were startled into the air and they began flying right towards the helicopter. Oh shoot, Norris said, lowering the binoculars. He grabbed the sniper rifle and began firing at the flock that was seconds away from swarming the helicopter. Lars tried to dodge around the pteranodons, but it did no good. Many collided and latched onto the helicopter. Alarms began blaring as the helicopter spun out of control, a problem only made worse when one of the flying reptiles flew into the blades and was turned into red mist. Norris was suddenly seized, drug out of the vehicle, and carried away by one of the flying carnivores. He was then swarmed by several pteranodons while in the air and cut to pieces with their large beaks. Lars's fate was different than Norris's gruesome one. He went down with the helicopter, which crashed into the swamp and, thanks to the grenades, exploded into a large blast of fire. It crashed near the albino Suchomimus, who just snorted, thinking that people had no business flying if they were going to be stupid about it. Yes, she thought because she was one of the rare talking ones. Hours later, when the helicopter failed to return to the city, the commanders of the Patriots' military force lost all hope of finding the hybrid. They just accepted 
that they had to hope the ecosystem could handle the additional wrench being thrown into it. Instead of continuing to search for it, they silently turned their attention to the people who had created it. Their focus now on what exactly the scientists in the lab had been doing in secret for years. One hybrid was now loose in the world. They wouldn't let any others get out there. And if the scientists had made one, then they likely had others ready to be unleashed as well. Dylan was forced to a sudden halt when Shadow stuck his arm out in front of him as they were about to exit the tree line and enter a meadow overgrown with long grass. Up until that point in the day, the only dinosaurs they'd seen were some grazing theres in the Saurus, which were large herbivorous dinosaurs with massive and dangerous claws on their fingertips, which made them worth avoiding whenever possible. Especially since they were never afraid to put those claws to use if they felt threatened, or even remotely agitated by something. In addition to the grazing herbivores, Dylan and Shadow had also passed the moss-covered skeleton of a Dilophosaurus that had gotten stuck in an old steel trap who knew how long before. So the sudden alert action by Shadow after a long period of nothing noteworthy occurring caught Dylan off guard and put him on edge right away. What? Dylan asked. Shadow glanced down at him, tapping one of his large toe claws on the ground in nervous agitation. There's a pack of raptors watching us from ahead in the grass, he spoke. Dylan looked back into the meadow, seeing no signs of any dinosaurs being present. Oh, he simply replied, shuddering as he did. Shadow snarled softly. We'll go around, he whispered, turning and following along the edge of the tree line. Dylan hurried after him. As they finished circling the meadow, Shadow again stopped and faced it. They're still following us, he said. For a brief moment, he saw red and wanted to lash out and attack. But he took a deep breath to compose himself. Leaving Dylan alone to attack a pack of raptors would negate the purpose of going around the meadow in the first place. So instead, he huffed and let out an ear-splitting roar louder than any natural dinosaur could have ever made, scaring multiple birds into flight. Dylan then heard chittering coming from within the grass and the sound of footsteps running away. <laughs> the advantages of being friends with a hybrid, Dylan chuckled. Thanks. Well, I didn't want them to eat you. I kind of like you, Shadow replied. There were no further encounters with any potential threats throughout the rest of their journey, and by mid-afternoon, the walls of their destination came into view through the trees ahead. That's it, Dylan said. So, how are we going to go about this? Shadow asked. I say no secrecy this time. Let's just walk right up and knock, Dylan answered. Hey, it's me, Enderman with a lower KC, and before the video ends, I have a few closing comments. Now that the setup portion of this storyline is done, you have to wait till the book comes out to see how this whole plot ends. I do hope you enjoyed these three narrations, though, and be sure to go listen to the others from the same universe. Shadow is one of my favorite characters from the whole book. He has what I think will be an interesting story of character growth, but he is also different than a lot of my other characters, too. I mean, sure, he has his teasing side, and, you know, he, he likes to poke fun. I, a lot of my characters like that, but from being locked in his cell for seven years, he has these severe anger issues, which flare up and which will cause problems. But what problems, you'll have to, you'll have to wait and see. 
He is also very protective, unintentionally nearly to the point of being possessive, as you've probably noticed, um, of his best friend, because that's the only good thing he's ever had. So showing how he grows and changes from the state he's in now and how he heals over time is something that I'm really excited to explore, and I think it's going to be a really bit of interesting character growth for him. There is a lot of themes of found family that I have in this book, and that will be even more true in not only how Shadow how and his story carries on, but also in the book itself and its eventual sequel. But that's all I'll say for now. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about the characters, listen to the other narrations to meet them naturally, or go watch the video of me going into detail and just exploring the ins and outs of each character. That'll all be linked below. So, until then, have a good one, everyone, and I hope to see you in the next video.